I'm ready, I'm ready with you. Uh, last week, I was a little bit jealous because Nate had the privilege of teaching on what I think is one of the most human moments in all of Scripture. There's a bunch of them, but this one in Ruth that he taught on last week so excellently uh, was one of the most human moments in all of Scripture to where Naomi, whose name means, uh, uh, means peaceful, is in such a, a life condition that she tells people to call her bitter. And I mean, you don't get any more human than that moment right there. And Nate walked us through that per, where, where Naomi was in her life at that moment and, and made a really good connection for us. And what I'm going to do this morning is take that same moment in Scripture from the perspective of Ruth. Last week we were looking at just Naomi and her bitterness. And this week we're looking at the same part of that story, but what was going on in Ruth's heart and mind while Naomi was going through what we talked about last week, and next week we're going to start looking at Boaz, and the week after that we're going to come back to Ruth and all seven weeks here. We could have done 14 weeks on this, we're going to do it in seven, so you're going to be excited about everything we cover, and some of you are going to be disappointed about some of the things we're just not able to get to in a seven-week series. So let's, let's look at the same passage from the perspective of Ruth. Uh, so in verse 7 of chapter 1, they're on the road from Moab to Judah, and we pick up in verse 8, and I am reading from the message, then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go back, each of you. To your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, uh, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? And in verse 12 and 13, she goes on this little hypothetical that she mentioned earlier. Hey, hey, go back to your mother's home. Find other husbands to take care of you. Find other men to take care of you because that's going to be your best option in this patriarchal society for security and financial stability. Just go back home because that's the place where you're going to find another husband. And then she goes on this little hypothetical journey of, you, you girls know how old I am, how old you are. Am I going to have a, a kids? And then you wait for them to grow up, and then you're going to marry those kids? And, and they're like, no. So we pick up in verse 14. As they wept aloud again, standing here on this road, then Oprah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi's logic made sense to Orpah. I think I said Oprah, didn't I? You should have laughed then. <laughs> Orpah. So Orpah kisses her goodbye. She follows the logic. It makes sense. Nothing wrong with any of this. There's, you hear a lot of commentary on Orpah and that she made the wrong decision and was un un unfaithful and loyal to Naomi, and that is not recorded anywhere in Scripture at all, just like Elimelech's decision to go to Moab in the first place. There's no, there's no commentary in the Scripture about that was the wrong decision. It's just setting up the story. And same with Orpah. It's not necessarily she made the wrong decision because she really did need that security. And she thought, you know what, Naomi makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go with her. So Orpah goes with her. In verse 15, look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law says to Ruth, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods go back with her. She's saying, you know, you were my people while my husband was alive and my son was alive to whom you were married and, and her husband was alive, my son to whom Orpah was married and, and we were family. So in this foreign land, we still had our people here and we had our people together. But now that they've all died, your people are over there. Go back with them and your sister-in-law is going back to her people, her gods. Go back with her. You can go ahead and stop right there for a while. We, the first week I talked a little bit about the difference in misfortune and loss, misfortune being, being an opportunity that we miss out on in the land of a whole bunch of other opportunities, but real loss is, is something different. 
Real loss takes something away from life that you can't get back, like her husband, like her father-in-law, like her brother-in-law. But when you face that loss, change has the potential to add something to life. Uh, Loss, real loss, is a bottomless pit. You can chase after that thing that you lost, but you're never going to reach it because it's a bottomless pit in that loss. But change can be a good turn when you're standing at a crossroad. Loss is not an option. When loss happens after the fact, you don't have the ability to unchoose the loss that you just experienced. But change is a possibility. It can be resisted. Change can be resisted or change can be embraced. Change can be forced upon us reluctantly, which change is often forced on us, or change can be chosen. So when we cling to loss and we resist change, we become a one-dimensional person in a three-dimensional world. So much of our pastoral counseling is in this context of, of people who have experienced great loss in some way, and they want to hold on to that loss and cling to that loss and resist change. And one of the things that we want to help them see, and oftentimes through the story of Ruth is we do have the choice to hold on to that loss or the possibility to stand at a crossroad and take a turn for change. In Ruth's story, death of her husband, death of her father-in-law, death of her financial security, her personal security could be something that she bitterly clings to And that's what Naomi was struggling with last week, was bitterly clinging to all of that loss. Or for Ruth this week, the death of her husband, the death of her brother-in-law and father-in-law has the possibility of becoming a catalyst for positive change. Everyone like Naomi would think that her options were gone. Like Orpah, the options are gone. Naomi's saying, here's your options, Ruth. In the midst of all of this loss, your options are gone. You have one option. Go back to your mother's home. Find a husband to take care of you. That's the only option you have left. All other options are gone. Orpah agreed with her and heads back. Go back and wait for a man to save you. But we're going to look at what Ruth did today. This change is a part of all of our worlds. Change is being forced on each and every one of you who are entering into a new stage of life. Whether you want it or not, the change is being forced on you. The loss is being forced on you. Graduating from high school forces loss of something behind you and puts the possibility of change in front of you. There is nothing like the 30-year-old who is still living their high school days. You talk about silly, but it is a great metaphor of the options that you have in facing your loss when change is forced upon you. We're all in an economy that for the last 15 years, we've been forced to change careers. The the life of my father, who started with one company at 18 or 19 years old and stayed with that company his entire career and resigned from that company or retired from that company, Those days are gone. Changes in career and skill sets are forced upon us. Your kids having kids is a stage of life change. But the changes that are forced upon us from life's losses are oftentimes completely out of our control, just like for Ruth this morning. All of the loss that put her at this crossroad was forced upon her. The company cut 600 jobs. You don't have any control over that. Your children move states away and they begin their own lives. A brother passes away. A parent dies. A tragic accident takes the life of your granddaughter. Your parents get divorced. Real loss is oftentimes completely out of our control. Ruth really helps us here. Naomi helps us here. 
When loss is forced upon us, some of us jump into the bottomless pit chasing that loss. And we change, but we change for the worst because we're diving into that pit that doesn't have a bottom because we are pursuing the loss that we're never going to get back. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes this is where eating disorders come from. It sparks depression that puts you in bed 18 hours a day. Or on the other side of it, some people it sparks them into that dopamine chase to where they start living risky lives on every level, chasing that bottomless pit of loss that they're never going to get back. So now they try to replace it with that dopamine dump from the things that they do. But then we have an example like Ruth, who when everyone else sees her options as limited to go back to her own people, her own mother, and find a husband to give her security, that change is not going to be forced upon her, but she allows it to open her up to a whole new possibility. We can allow change that's forced on us through loss to help us attempt things that we've never attempted before. We move from being church attenders to participants in the full body of Christ. We don't cling to the past because of circumstances. Because of that loss, those circumstances no longer bind us to the past. It opens up the possibility for real change. And like Ruth, we begin to walk away from one life toward another, all for good reasons. And change frightens us. But it can also free us from our old selves. And it can prepare us for a new start. Ruth begins to let us see in the midst of all of this devastating loss that was forced upon her that there still can be hope and new life and choices beyond that loss. When change is forced upon us and we dive into that bottomless pit as opposed to allowing it to be a positive change, we all know and see the difference there. We see the difference. We see the difference of the losses that we've taken an inventory of over the first two weeks of this series. Some of you have wavered back and forth between those two. That on some months, some days, some years, you go back to pursuing that loss and and you start going back down into that bottomless pit. And then you realize that's what you're doing, and then you swing the other way and start going, but i got to move on with my life. Something new has to happen here, and we go back and forth and back and forth. We want to allow Ruth to be an encouragement to us, to remind us of the same thing that the people of Israel reminded us of on that 40-year journey in the wilderness. And that is the one thing that you do have control over when you are in the midst of tragic loss, like her father-in-law, her husband and her brother-in-law, her financial security, her life security in the midst of all of that loss. Who you are becoming is the one thing you have control over. You can continue to become that person that dives into that bottomless pit and wishes you were back in Egypt with the old life. Or you can become that person who says, the one thing that I do have control over is who I am becoming on this journey. So for those of us who in the last two weeks have been living in this series and and thinking about the losses, I want Ruth to bring that to our minds this morning. That everyone else is saying, you only have one option, go back home, be with your people, find a husband, let him take care of you, and move on with your life. But we continue here somewhere between Moab and Judah, the three of them find themselves at this crossroad And the story slows down as we get into verses 16 and 17 and takes a shift to a conversation that gives voice to what is at stake for each one of these women. They all must decide where home is. And Orpah yields to Naomi. But here we see this familiar passage of Scripture where Ruth clings to her and expresses a very deep commitment to her. In the New Living Translation, she says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, let's try it again. Wherever you go, wherever you live, your people will be 
and your God will, will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. This sure sounds a lot like a covenant commitment that we're familiar with from the Old Testament. Ruth, her whole life, who's being told that your only option is go back to your home, find someone to take care of you. She has been everything to everybody so far in her life. She's been a dutiful wife. She's been a faithful daughter-in-law. She's been a good Moabite woman. She's followed all of the rules, someone else's rules, all of her life. But now she sees another life. And she's caught a glimpse of the living God, not the false small G gods of her people, but she has caught a glimpse in the life of Naomi and possibly Elimelech too. She's caught a glimpse of the living God and now she sees herself at a crossroad with the potential of having a completely new start in life. She's unhooking the anchor behind her as she's drawn to the horizon to which Naomi is walking. Ruth seeks God beyond the boundaries of her past. And Ruth looks at her family of origin and instead ventures on to an unknown place, to unknown people in a family or in a foreign land. Man, some of the greatest testimony stories that I enjoy. You know, when you, how many of you come to Christ and your family had been praying for you for a while when you come to Christ and you become a follower of Christ and you're baptized, your family had been praying for you, they were gathered around to celebrate? How many of you accepted Christ and that was your situation? Your family was have been supportive. Raise your hands if your family supported you. Yeah, absolutely, right? It's a celebration. Some of you are praying for people, friends or family to come to Christ and when they accept Christ, you're going to be there to celebrate them. Well, it's a whole different story for some of you who are raised in families that had a deep faith in a dead religion, had a deep faith in a dead doctrine, had a deep faith and trust in something, and now that you have become a follower of Jesus Christ, some of the greatest testimonies I see are from people who were from extremely religious families, but were not truly followers of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. I love to see those people come to Christ. The other stories I love to hear and see and and I have a heavy heart for is many of you accepted Christ and your family of origin was a family of origin that was agnostic. And and they had an antagonism towards Christianity. They have an antagonism towards the caricature that they believe following Jesus is. And when you accepted Christ, you received no support at all. This is what Ruth is facing, she is facing leaving her family of origin to follow the one true living God. I I, I just happened to notice uh, that Joe's here with us this morning. Let's stand up and stand up, Joe, and we're, we're glad our prayers have been answered and he's back safe from Pakistan. But the whole challenge to that ministry is that the call of the gospel is to leave the security of your, of your false religion to leave the security that your family demands and potentially risk your life for faith in following Jesus Christ. And this is the situation that Naomi is in. As one commentator wrote, Ruth finds herself at this crossroad, herself, and I quote now, I, I was making it up there as I went. <laughs> Ruth finds herself at odds with her culture with her country, her religion, and her role in life. One by one, she chooses against each one. A a Moabite, she makes the decision to go to the Jewish city of Bethlehem, where race and religion will marginalize her forever. I pause there. She only has limited legal rights as a foreigner. Instead of going back to her home country, she is walking away from all of that to go to a foreign country as a foreigner who has limited rights. And back to the, to the writer, a follower of the tribal god, Kamesh. She professes faith in the one God, Yahweh. A marriageable young woman, she opts for independence rather than set about finding a man to care for her. She opts for independence. End of quote. Ruth has clearly changed her mind 
about the small g gods and what it means to have a relationship with the small g gods versus a covenant relationship with Yahweh, someplace, somehow, she has been transformed. She has made up her own mind. She has begun to define herself rather than allow someone else to do it for her. And I hope in this teaching today from Ruth, there are some of you watching online and some of you in here today that you're in that situation. Your family of origin has you trapped in a dead religion. They have you trapped in a dead faith in God. And Jesus this morning is speaking to you saying, follow the example of Ruth. Follow the example of Ruth. She's made up her own mind. She's begun to define herself rather than allowing someone else to do it for her. It's one of the values of us having the name New Start and encouraging us to tell people about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because there are people in your path this week, in your sphere of influence, that are in living situations, family situations, marital situations that are antagonistic against God and the Holy Spirit is drawing them to himself and their decision to be a follower of Christ is going to cost them something. It's going to be difficult for them. And we as a people and as a church want to be there for them. Ruth's transformed before our eyes and sets off to make her way in the world with God, who's going to see her through to the end. She's making a covenant with God and with Naomi. It was Naomi's faith in the Lord through all the uncertainty that that may have played a role in pointing Ruth to the Lord. All of the difficult things that this daughter-in-law watched her mother-in-law go through, and then she doesn't curse God. Some of you have gone through very difficult times in life and are going through those losses right now. People are watching you. Ruth is reminding us, and Naomi is reminding us that people are watching you. Your face, your continued participation in the body of Christ, you participating in community through your loss and your brokenness helps point them to God. Because when everything's going swimmingly in your life and prosperity's all over you and everything's going well, people aren't paying any attention to you. But the second real loss hits, people indirectly, subconsciously think, wow, let's see what happens now. Let's watch here. And when Naomi went through what she went through and Ruth saw that, that has an impact in in, in your life. For those of you who are going through difficulty right now, your faithfulness can have a positive impact to people around you. So Ruth reacted at this crossroad. Everyone's saying you only have one option. But Ruth acted. She had no promise in hand. She had no divine blessing that was pronounced to her that if you make this turn on this crossroad and head to Judah with Naomi, everything's going to be perfect. You're going to find a husband. You're going to find security. Everything's going to be okay. We want to live a little bit in this moment, even though we know the end of the story at the moment that Ruth is standing at this crossroad. She does not know any of it. There's no blessing on her. There's no spouse waiting for her. There's no possessions waiting for her in Judah. There's no support waiting for her in Judah. She's going to have limited legal rights, and she gave up the possibility of going home and finding a man to devote himself to her and take care of her, and instead she devoted herself to her mother-in-law in a world that was dominated by men. I, this week, as I just kept thinking about Ruth standing at this crossroad because it's so easy for us to jump to chapters three and four. And one of the things that frustrates me about the story of Ruth is I can't find a timeline anywhere for how long each of these things are going on. So that's not the point. Otherwise, we would have the timeline of that. That's not the point of whether it was years or weeks or days. But what we can do and should do on the third message of this series is sit here this morning and think about Ruth standing there at that crossroad. There was no Boaz in her future. 
There was no promise of grain and wealth. There was no promise of being taken care of. This is a person who is standing here saying, instead of choosing security and false gods back home, I choose a community covenant relationship with this person. And I choose a covenant relationship with Yahweh. And without knowing what's going to become of this, this loss is going to become a catalyst for positive change in my life. I'm going to make a turn on this crossroad. I'm going to Judah with you. Don't stop me, Naomi. I'm going to Judah with you. I hate loyalty card programs. How many of you love loyalty card programs? Yeah, okay, a lot of you. Nothing wrong with that. They're generally good because they provide you a benefit when you do that. The thing I hate about loyalty card programs is, one, I hate carrying all those things around. There's so many of them still to this date. Now you got to download apps and do this, that, and the other and take cards and all of that stuff. But loyalty programs to me feel so cheap and so commercial and like I'm being manipulated and like they're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to psychologists to figure out how to get me in their store more often and spend my money on their stuff and that's one of the ways that they do it is with those loyalty card programs and I just have such I have a negative reaction to that and it's the thing I love about Ruth she's not asking for a loyalty card she's not being offered a loyalty card She's not being offered anything. She is having to walk away from the faith of her family of origin. She's having to walk away from the place to where she has full legal rights. She's walking away from the place where she can find security. And she's walking towards the one true living God without knowing how it's going to turn out. I've been so excited about this message this morning because there are some of you watching and sitting here today that that is the situation that you're in. That's the situation that you're in, and we want to pray about it today.